CJ Knows Show. According to the Sentencing Project, 27 states and the federal government incarcerated 90,873 people in the private prisons in 2022, representing 8% of the total state and federal prison population. I don't even think that includes immigration, but we'll get to that later. You may think for profit prisons, some owned by publicly traded corporations, is a modern concept. But I guess Dr. Robin Bernstein, author of Freeman's Challenge, The Murder That Shook America's Original Prison for Profit, will tell you that it is not the case. Dr. Bernstein is a cultural historian who specializes in U.S. racial formation from the 19th century to the present. She is the Dillon Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard University. Currently the chair of Harvard's doctoral program in American Studies, she's also a faculty member in the undergraduate program in theater, dance, and media. Her previous book, Racial Innocence, Performing American Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights is a five-time award winner. Wow. Uh, Dr. Robin Bernstein, thank you for joining us today on the CJ No Show. I really appreciate the time, and um, and hopefully you can do some song and dance and theater reproductions as we talk about the serious the subjects of, uh, of for-profit prisons back in the day. Thank you for coming on, on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Bernstein, before we get into the details of the story of William Freeman and the early for-profit prison in the village of Auburn in upstate New York, what inspired and prepared you to take this subject on? Why, why, why was it so important for you? Well, I think it's really important for us to understand the true history of profit-driven incarceration. Okay. Before I started this project, like a lot of people, I associated profit-driven incarceration with the South, and right. I associated it with the period after the Civil War. I thought of, of um, convict leasing and, um, and, and chain gangs as an invention of the South and as, quote, slavery by another name, unquote. And right. I was really surprised to learn that, in fact, these practices originated not in the South, but in the North. And they originated not after the Civil War, but long before the Civil War. So this gives us a very different picture of the origins of prison for profit. And I felt like it was really important to bring that story to the public. And, and why, why, why do you think this started? I'm just curious. I mean, why, why uh, profit prisons way back then? I mean, um, why, why do you think, who came up with this idea? I mean, why were they so interested in this? Yeah, well, it was a group of white entrepreneurs who I name in my book. It was a group of very specific people who had um, what was then a radical idea. So this was 1816 in New York okay. State. Slavery was in the process of being abolished in New York. It was slowly going out. And New York was transferring from being a slavery-based economy to being a state capitalist-based economy, meaning right. that the state itself was fueling development. The state itself was doing things like building the Erie Canal, for example. And at the time, there was only one prison in New York State, and it was overrun and it was notoriously corrupt. So the state offered a, a fee, basically. The state offered $20,000 to any vicinity that would build a new prison. And what these white entrepreneurs, the insight that they had was that just the way the Erie Canal was going to completely transform the economy of New York State, they had this insight that a prison could do the same for their village. Auburn at the time was a tiny little village. And tw the $20,000 contract was about the equivalent of half a million dollars today. Wow. So to us, you and I, we understand that if you take a tiny little village with about 2000 people and you flood it all of a sudden with half a million dollars with more money to come every year in perpetuity, that's going to completely transform the economy. Right. Now to you and me, that's obvious, but the only reason it's obvious is because these entrepreneurs who are in my book came up with this idea. They had this insight. At the, at the time, nobody else had that insight. 
Was so it they, the first of its kind in the country yes. or, or, or they've tried this elsewhere? Do you know? Or No, this was the first of its kind in, in the country. So what they did was they took that, they got, they won the contract and they took that $20,000 and they built a prison. So the whole point of the prison was to suck money out of the state to right. make Auburn rich. But then they came up with a second idea for how to turn this into a money generating um, entity. And what they did was they built their prison on the banks of a river. The whole point of that was to gather water power from the river in order to run factories. So they built factories into the prison. And this was the idea from the very beginning. This is why they built the prison where they built it. So they built factories right um, into the prison. And the idea from the very beginning was that prisoners would be forced to work in these factories. And the factories were run by private companies. So the companies were leasing the labor of the, of the prisoners, paying the prison for their labor. The prisoners were being forced to work. They didn't get a penny, no wages right. at all. And then the companies were selling these goods that the prisoners were manufacturing all over the Northeast. So the prison was simultaneously sucking money out of the state, and then it was sucking labor out of the prisoners, and then it was taking money from these corporations, which in turn were making a ton of money. It, so it doesn't this was, sound like a bad idea when they came up with it. I mean, it's entrepreneurial and it probably thought that it, it did it help the community in any way? Well, I mean, it was a scheme to get rich and it, in, in a lot of ways it worked. It absolutely did transform Auburn from a village into a city. It made a lot of people uh, prosperous. And what it did even more than that was it gave a large number of people steady, reliable income. Okay. And what that did, of course, was it bought their consent for this new form of slavery this new form of unfreedom. And when I say slavery, by the way, that's the word that they used. And they used it proudly. They used it as a positive. They said that the prisoners were, quote, slaves of the state. And they said that with pride. So when I call it slavery, I'm not imposing a modern idea on the past. Right. That was actually the idea they used. Doc, well, Dr. We, Bernstein, we, we have, have pictures, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we have some pictures. In fact, uh, they're still proud of it because I think the very first picture that you'll see is a plaque commemorating the use of the uh, the slave labor there in the construction. We, um, here's a picture of the the prison. You you can comment. Dr. Sure. Bernstein. Well, what this is this is a picture that um, of the Auburn State Prison in the 1800s, and what you can see is the river. Um, the river is really clear, and the river is actually central in this image. And that's a great, uh, it's a great image that you chose because in fact, the river was central to the prison itself. The river was power. The river right. is what drove the factories. The river enabled everything. So yeah. this is a really terrific image. Awesome. What do we have next, Henry? Well, that... That's the Auburn State Prison today. So um, the Auburn State Prison still exists. Today it's called the Auburn Correctional Facility. And it is still a center of manufacturing. It is still right on that river, although of course it doesn't use water power anymore. There are still factories inside the Auburn Prison. And the prison is now the site of the manufacturing of license plates. Every single license plate in New York State, 100% of them are built in the Auburn prison to this still, day. Still privately owned? No. Well, the prison was actually never privately owned. And we can talk about that. It was, it was for profit in the sense that it was created from the very beginning for the purpose of generating profit. And that's what I mean when I call it a for profit prison. But it okay. was never a private prison, not now and not then. So, so the state benefited from this system as well, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely oh. it did. Okay. And if I could just point out on the, the plaque there, they didn't, they weren't enslaved. They were assisting according to the plaque. Yeah, you know, well, that's pretty euphemistic. <laughs> Amazing. Now, you, yeah. in your, your book, you talk about William Freeman. Um, 
you became incarcerated. How, what happened there? What can you tell us about? Yeah, William Freeman was an African-American and also Native American teenager. He was 15 years old. He was born in Auburn, the site of this radical new part, new vision of unfreedom. So he was born there. He grew up alongside the prison. He was actually born into the most prominent black family in town. So he was somebody who was really well known and um, and well uh, cared for in the in the town of Auburn. Right. And he had a, in a lot of ways, he had a good life. But everything changed in 1840. In that year, when William Freeman was 15, he was accused of stealing a horse. He swore he didn't do it, but and there was no hard evidence against him, but it didn't matter. He was tried, he was convicted, and he was sentenced to five years hard labor in the Auburn State Prison. Now, William Freeman had always been free. His father had been enslaved. His mother had always been free. His grandparents had been enslaved. And in fact, his grandparents had been forced to build many of the structures in the village of Auburn. Wow. So here he is, he's 15 years old and he is thrown into this prison and he is told you are now a slave of the state. And he is told that he has to labor 12 hours a day, every day, filing iron. He's put in a factory, a private owned, privately run factory no. that is manufacturing animal harnesses. And William Freeman's job was to file iron for 12 hours a day for no pay at all. And he was furious. And what William Freeman did was he very bravely challenged the system. He challenged it uh, first with words and then he challenged it in other ways. And that is what my book is about. So it, it, the Freeman's challenge and the title is him taking on the system. Exactly. And how did he do that? Well, the first thing he did was he spoke up and that was a really brave thing to do. Uh, first of all, it was brave because um, believe it or not, and it's very hard to take this in, um, prisoners in the Auburn State Prison at this time were forbidden from speaking at all, wow. ever. And it is very hard to take that in, the enormity of that. But I am speaking the absolute truth. They were not allowed to speak at all, ever. And, um, and there was enormous violence. I mean, if you said hello, there would be enormous violence, enormous retribution for that. And Freeman not only spoke, he's told his jailers that he did not want to work. And he right. said that he did not want to work before, quote, for nothing. And he meant two things by that. He meant that he did not want to work for no pay and that he did not want to work because he had committed no crime. And as you can imagine, this did not go over well and there was enormous violence against William Freeman. So, I, I mean, he, he must have suffered quite a bit. He was a martyr in a sense of making the change. Did it actually work or, I mean, how did that function? Yeah, he um, he he suffered enormously, and he was he was beaten, he was whipped, he was waterboarded. Believe it or not, the Auburn State Prison invented a new form of waterboarding, and he was waterboarded. And in the worst instance, he was uh, a, a guard beat him with a board, and beat him so badly that he suffered a brain injury, and he became deaf as a result of that beating, and still. William Freeman persisted. He kept challenging the original prison for profit. Uh, what kind of, what, what have you learned from this? I mean, uh, uh, has it changed your worldview or anything? I mean, you obviously you study this, you, you see what happened to, to him, to Freeman. How does this affect you? What do you think we've learned from this or yeah. why is this important? Well, I think one thing that's really important is that William Freeman was saying something really important. William Freeman was saying that it is wrong to steal a person's labor, that uh, profit-driven incarceration is a form of organized labor theft, that the state was stealing his labor from him, all the while that the state was accusing him of being a thief. William Freeman had a kind of moral clarity. He was saying it is wrong to steal my labor. It is wrong to force me to work for nothing. And I think that's a, a message that we need to hear today. We can think of California's Prop 6, which just 
failed to pass. California's Prop 6, Proposition 6, was basically making it illegal for prisons in California to force uh, prisoners to work. And this is exactly what Freeman was saying. It is wrong to force people to work. And in California, people are paid a very small amount of money. People are paid as little as eight cents per hour. They max out at a dollar an hour. And when you're being paid eight cents an hour, but you have to buy things that basically keep your body alive, things like soap or right. toothpaste, you're basically earning nothing. And so people in California today are being forced to work for basically no pay, just to keep enough to keep their bodies alive, but nothing else. Dr. And Bernstein, don't you think if, if Freeman's original argument was that he was an innocent person, is, is that correct? Well, you it think was that had to play into this, I'm not working uh, challenge because I didn't commit a crime, why am I being enslaved? It's a form of slavery if, if I'm, uh, if I'm wrongly accused, like they used to do in the South after 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 the Civil War, when they needed yeah. to, to to get the crops, they'd just charge people with things so they could during the crop season pick in time. Yep. yep. Yeah. He was making two claims. One was that it was wrong for him to work because he was innocent. He was saying that, but he was also saying that it was wrong for him to be forced to work for no pay. That was really important to him. It wasn't only that he did not want to work. It was that he wanted to earn a living. And right. he was absolutely explicit about that. So what, now when we go to today's modern time, for instance, in our modern world, so to speak, and you're saying that you're, you're stealing their labor, uh, but do, do the prisoners have rights if they've been convicted? I mean, obviously, if they're in jail, uh, standing trial, waiting for a resolution of their case, um, but let's say they're convicted of whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. um, do they have these rights in your opinion that they could just sit around and do nothing? Or, I mean, you don't think there's, I mean, don't you think they may be, they may lose their rights when, when they can commit uh, certain felonies or, or crimes of violence or anything else? Uh, or do you think they should just be taken care of and spent, you know, that we should spend our resources to just keep them there? Um, well, when, how do you justify this or where do you fall on these ideas? Sure. When people are convicted of crimes, they do not right. lose all their human rights. If people were convicted of crimes, then you could take somebody who shoplifted and you could harvest their organs. You could cut off their hands. But we don't believe that. We don't believe that that's an OK thing to do, because we believe that people who are convicted of crimes do retain so, uh, many human rights. And then the question becomes, where does forced labor fall on this spectrum of human rights? So, and it also raises the question of what is the purpose of a prison? Why should prisons exist? Now, there are some people who say that prisons exist for the purpose of punishment. The purpose is to punish people. But even then, you still have a line where, where, what kind of punishment is okay and what kind of punishment is not okay. So for example, whipping is not considered an okay punishment right now. In William Freeman's day, it was considered an okay punishment. So I believe that if prisons are going to exist, they should exist for the purpose of justice. They should exist for the purpose of making the world a better place. And Pure punishment is not a form of justice. Pure punishment is not making the world a better place. I do think that if prisons are going to exist, they should involve um, opportunities to work. They should involve opportunities for meaningful work that will improve people's lives. May, most people who are incarcerated want to work for the same reasons that most people who are not incarcerated want to work. I want to work. You clearly want to work. Work is meaningful. Work gives our lives um, meaning. Work can give us joy. Work can teach us things. Work can give us money that we can use to support the people we love and to support ourselves. These are all good things. Work gives us opportunities to develop our skills and exercise our skills. These are all good things. And for all these reasons, I believe that opportunities to work in prison absolutely should exist. But what I don't believe is that people should be forced to work 
when they don't want to, and especially that they should be forced to work in jobs that teach them nothing, that do not enact justice at all, that do not give them any kind of vocational skills, that do not uh, assist in re-entry beyond prison. These are not; these are things that do not serve justice. So you don't think? Uh, I, you know, I, the, the big topics always were recidivism rate and people who commit crimes go back, and that we're not punishing them, but. Do you think that by doing the other things that there's a possibility of keeping out of returning to prison again? And by doing these things, they're just going to revolve back in. It's not going to help them. Is is that what you're is that what you're saying? That in a well, way? well, what the evidence shows really clearly is that recidivism is an enormous problem, and that when people are in, incarcerated and they do not learn any kind of life skills, they do not gain any kind of vocational skills. If they are released into the non-carceral world, it is very hard to reintegrate into society. And William Freeman actually experienced that. He was released in 1845 and he gets out of prison and now he's 20 years old and he's deaf and he has been traumatized. He has been traumatized by five years of violence and silence. And he gets out of prison and he tries to reconnect with his family and he tries to reconnect with friends and with community and he tries to make a living and that's really important and he struggles he struggles terribly and what he did was he 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 raised a legal case against the auburn state prison he accused the prison of stealing his labor and he tried to raise a legal case and and how did he end up that result well, it did not go well. Um, he was laughed at and he was dismissed and he was um, he, he, he went to magistrates and they refused to help him. And then eventually William Freeman turned to violence. And when I say that, I'm not giving anything away in the book. And by the way, I, I want to emphasize that every word in the book is true. It reads like a novel. It tells um, a really compelling story of one very brave teenager. Um, but every word is true. So Freeman did um, resort to violence. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not giving anything away, no spoilers. Um, the, it's the murder that's in the title of the book. The, the full title of the book is Freeman's Challenge, the murder that shook America's original prison for profit. William Freeman did commit a murder and he, it was a strike against the Auburn State Prison. And in terms of what happened, well, that's what the book is about, but one thing we do know is that the prison still exists. Dr. Bernstein, it's fascinating. We really thank you for your time on this subject. And I would sure love to explore how this might play into what happens in today and in immigration and other issues. But thank you very much for being on our program. And I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm running right to the bookstore. I'm going to get that stuff, right? At least on Amazon. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. <laughs>